you. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, you can for reading it. one of those slides. Oh. Anyone, leave them. You can. Good afternoon, everyone. I thank uh, each and every one of you for giving me this opportunity to be amongst you to uh, give a very brief introduction about phenol neurosurgery. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here. I have heard a lot about uh, various IMAs and especially about the Kodambakam IMA. I don't know about the Manmoh and Modi issues, but I have heard very good things about the Kodambakam IMA. Very key members, always uh, well attended IMA, irrespective of the uh, uh, time of the year. So it's my pleasure to be here and I see a lot of uh, familiar faces and uh, I hope uh, I'll take you through the next 20 minutes uh, in a more delighted fashion. I think I've had a little bit of a snack, so to keep you awake, I have to be on, on my toes. So, uh, pinhole neurosurgery, what it exactly means? You've all heard about subspecialty of neurosurgery. Uh, we do a lot of things without opening the skull, just by gaining access through the arterial system. We treat a variety of disease, and this is what we mean by pinhole neurosurgery. Uh, in the past, it has always been in the domain of radiologists. The radiologists have taken the speed forward certainly, but now uh, neurosurgeons are catching up. Neurosurgeons are catching up doing these procedures, and neurosurgeons are in a better position to treat various uh, neurological disorders uh, through endovascular means. This is actually the replica of uh, acrylic injection of the blood vessels of head and neck. These are the natural roadways which are present in our body. And the idea to exploit this natural pathways to deliver therapy has been in work for more than 100 years, but the technology wasn't there. People were waiting for the technology to develop. Luckily, uh, in our era, in the past 20, 30 years, the computers have grown and the technology has improved so much that today we are able to do all these procedures in a minimally invasive fashion. <clears throat> As a neurosurgeon, I was practicing after my training, uh, I saw the beauty and elegance of this minimally invasive technology. And I really thought, if you can treat some intracranial disease without doing a craniotomy, it's a great thing for the patient, and it's a great feeling for you as well. So as a surgeon, I did not want to resist the change, I wanted to embrace the innovation and become part of it. That's when I went ahead with the training. So I actually did my MBBS from other medical college, then my neurosurgery from Metro's Medical College here. Then um, went to the uh, University of Zurich where I did my micro neurosurgical training as well. And then moved on to the US where in Columbia University I did my uh, fellowship in neuro intervention. And subsequent to my training, I had the opportunity to work at Mount Sinai Hospital as an assistant professor for, for about uh, five and a half years. And then I've moved back here and only for the past five months I've uh, joined the Apollo Hospitals in Chennai. The concept of a hybrid neurosurgeon doing both open and endovascular procedure is very much in vogue in the Western countries, but in India, the concept is hugely lacking, and there are only a few uh, hybrid neurosurgeons. What are the diseases we can potentially treat? Today, I'm going to just focus on the pinhole neurosurgery, give just an overview, a broad overview of various diseases we treat, because each of these diseases I can talk for about an hour. So we treat a variety of disease using the spinal neurosurgery. Uh, most commonly, the arteriovenous malformation, cerebral aneurysms, we treat acute strokes, carotid stenosis, intracranial stenosis, various tumors, we do preoperative embolization, and spinal cord vascular malformation, spinal neural fistulas, and pediatric vascular malformations as well. I'm just going to take you briefly through it, and we treat diseases uh, from newborn to very old age. <coughs> Today, to do these procedures, the basic requirements are a biplane, cath lab with dynasty and 3D reconstruction capability. Okay, I'm just going to talk to you about various diseases, taking them section by section. Hopefully, I don't exceed the 20 minutes. Cerebral aneurysms. You all, uh, at some point, would have heard of uh, somebody with uh, acute bleed in the brain, uh, or, uh, had aneurysms in the brain. That's a quite common disease. It was thought that Indians don't get aneurysms, but it is not so. Indians are on par with the Western world and they do get aneurysms. There are various types of aneurysms and I'm not going to bore you with that, but the most common ones are the saccular aneurysms and the fusiform aneurysms. 
and they may be unruptured like this or ruptured. And they occur in various locations and the most common locations being the anterior communicating artery and the posterior communicating artery locations. And it happens in 1 in 50 people. In India, it may be like around slightly less, 1 in 75 to 100 people. When someone presents with a ruptured aneurysm, what do they usually present with? It's an acute severe headache. Acute severe headache is never taken so seriously in our society, but in the Western world, anybody with an acute severe headache, they always think of a ruptured aneurysm. Anybody walking into the emergency room with severe headache, which they have never experienced in their past, we should always, always, especially as primary physician, somebody is walking to your office with severe headache, we should always think that they have a ruptured aneurysm. A high index of suspicion is extremely essential. When we do a CT scan, if you find this, the diagnosis is pretty clear. The patient has had an ruptured aneurysm, and we need to take uh, the patient further for further treatment. If the CT does not show anything, what do you do then? Please remember, if a patient presents with an acute severe headache, a thunderclap headache is usually the headache which increases in severity within the first minute of its onset. And if the CT does not show this picture, if the CT is uh, reported as normal, the patient should undergo a lumbar puncture to look for xanthochromia. If xanthochromia is positive, unless proved otherwise, there is a rupture in yours. And the patient has to go for treatment. So from the primary physician point of view, a high index of suspicion is absolutely essential because these disease, this disease is dangerous. Per se, having an aneurysm is not dangerous, but when it ruptures, it is extremely dangerous because one third of them die immediately, only two thirds reach hospital. Okay, what are the treatment options? There are two treatment options. The most familiar one is the surgical clipping, which we've been doing, it, doing for the past uh, 30, 40 years in India. And the other one is the endovascular embolization. The endovascular embolization, I think the first embolization was done in the uh, early 2000s in India. And since then, we commonly do it. And in today's world, about 80 to 90 percent of the aneurysms we can treat by endovascular means. Only about 10 to 15 percent of aneurysms need open surgical clipping. <coughs> How do we do it? If the aneurysm is really a berry shape with a narrow neck, then we do a simple coiling. This is how it works. There's a patient with an ACOM aneurysm. As you can see here, a small bubble in the middle. This is a ruptured aneurysm with a narrow neck. Here, you have the microcatheter in place. This is the white dot as a microcatheter. Here you can see here the microcatheter going through the uh, blood vessels. And this is at the end of coiling. The aneurysm is no more filling. The ACOM is well preserved. So this is a small, tiny little coil placed uh, within the patient. And the aneurysm is secure. If the neck is broad, when you put in a coil, the coil is not going to stay. So we have various techniques. What we do is we place a balloon across the base of the aneurysm and we coil it. This is one such case of a P1 segment or a basilite of aneurysm. As you can see here, this is like a guy running around with a head. This head is abnormal. This is the aneurysm with a small peak. And this is an oblique projection. This is treated with a balloon assist coiling. As you can see here without the balloon inflation, a little bit of the coil is protruding down. And this is at the end of the coiling, very well coiled. The aneurysm is not filling anymore. When the base of the aneurysm is really broad, you can't put a coil with a balloon assistance. Even with balloon assistance, the coil is going to fly into the parent vessel, which you don't want. So what we do is that we do a stent assist coiling. For example, this case is a vertebral artery aneurysm, a dysplastic one with a, a small uh, bubble. This is a 3D imaging. This we treated with double stent. As you can see here, the tiny dots here, the struts, these are the strengths, the stents which are placed within the vessel. And this is a coil which is placed around it. And this is the 3D at the end of the coiling. Uh, the vessel is well preserved and the aneurysm is well taken care of. And today we have newer treatments for aneurysms, especially over the past four or five years, we have what is called a flow diverter. The flow diverter is more like a stent, but it is a more closed knit stent. <clears throat> I'm not going to go into the details of it because that itself takes about an hour to describe about it. There are uh, various types of flow diverters available. The most common one is the pipeline. And I commonly use the thread. As you can see here, this is a dysplastic aneurysm. In the past, 
we may use the status as spoiling or we may take down or occlude the scarotid if the cross flow in the brain is good. But today we treat them with flow divergence. This is at the end of treatment after six months you can see the vessel is completely remodeled. This is one other case of uh, cavernous IC aneurysm patient presenting with uh, total ophthalmoplegia with severe headache with a large aneurysm arising from the ICA. This is a Fred stent placement and that, uh, immediately after placement you can see the contrast is stagnating in and at six months the vessel is completely remodeled with complete cure of the aneurysm. And by endovascular or a pinhole neurosurgery we also treat various types of avians. But you should understand that avian is treated by multimodal management. Most avians are being managed medically today because of the Aruba trial, but a lot of avians we treat with combined modality. The common modalities are surgery, radiosurgery, and endovascular embolization. Before treating an avian, we plan, we make a final planning for that for a particular avian. Most ruptured avians, we strategize the treatment, whether we're going to treat by embolization alone or embolization with surgery or embolization with radiosurgery or the combination. So we have various embolic agents today. I'm not going, going to go into the details, but these are the four common embolic agents. Among this, I just want to tell you the difference. This NPCA was the first embolic agent used. This is just like a crazy glue, uh, like a heavy quake or like a crazy glue. You mix it with the contrast material and you put in the blood vessel, it immediately reacts and closes out the vessel. Whereas the other three embolic agents, oops, other three embolic agents here, these are like lava. You put in the blood vessel, they slowly creep and fill the spaces, vascular spaces, and they obliterate the avian. Role of embolization, as I'm talking about the pinhole neurosurgery, the role of embolization may be curative. Curative in a sense, only with embolization you completely cure the avian. This is one of the cases of a pediatric mural type of uh, vein of gallon malformation. As you can see here, this is a child presenting with congestive heart failure with a large venous sac and there are a couple of feeders feeding into this avian. This is after one session of embolization, the avian is completely cured. We also do preoperative endovascular ligations. We plan and there are certain cortical avians where we just do embolization to uh, occlude the major big vessels going into the avian and then we resect the avian by surgery. This is one such case of a preoperative embolization, onyx uh, injection was done. Onyx injection was in fact done very well and in the US usually we uh, resect most of the particle avians because onyx is uh, approved to be uh, only resected. We also do pre-radiosurgical embolization. This is a procedure where we reduce the burden of the avian. For example, if you're planning to send a patient to radiosurgery, uh, it has to be of certain size. It has to be less than 2.5 centimeters. We peripherally embolize the aviums, reduce or shrink the size of the avium so that the avium is of a certain size so we can send the patient uh, to radiosurgery and he becomes amenable to radiosurgery. So this is one such case where I've done a pre-radiosurgical uh, uh, embolization to reduce the size and send the patient for radiosurgery. There are certain situations where we do palliative embolizations. Some of the aliens are untreatable because they are located in extremely eloquent regions where we cannot resect these aliens uh, without major deficit and we cannot embolize them completely. We do palliative target embolization. This is one such case, a patient presenting with a small intracerebral bleed. As you can see here, a tiny bleed. But if you look at the angiogram, it's disastrous. You see a huge avian. You have to pinpoint where this avium has bled. So you fish out the region, you try to localize where it has bled. Potentially we localize to this region where the avium has bled. We selectively catheterize, you can see the microcatheter all the way up here going into the small bubble. That bubble is the one that is bled. So we embolize that. And we also embolize the weak spots in the avium. As you can see here, the avium, because of the high flow nature, there is an aneurysm. So we embolize that aneurysm as well. This is called target embolization. Uh, coming to the pediatric vascular malformation, most of the neonatal or the pediatric vascular malformations are extremely high flow. They present in childhood because they are high flow vascular malformations. They are the most difficult vascular malformations in the brain to treat. They are the king of vascular malformations. And some of them we identify by routine ultrasound 
antenatal. This is an antenatal MRI showing the uh, vascular malformation. Most of them, we, we face with significant challenges when we treat these neonates because they are having severe congestive heart failure, they have multi-system failure, they have hepatic failure, they have renal failure, secondary to the heart failure, and uh, we cannot use a lot of contrast. Access to the vascular system is extremely difficult. Sometimes we use the umbilical artery to gain access to the vascular system, or we use the femoral artery, uh, but the femoral artery don't withstand these access. They may get completely occluded and their vascular system is immature. This is once a child. We have prep. This is a uh, parodial type of a gallon malformation. As you can see here, there is a large venous sac with multiple feeders. It is very hard to pinpoint which one to treat, but practically we go for the large feeders in the acute situation, in the newborn period. We just take the child out of the congestive heart failure by reducing the flow within the vascular malformation. So we go for the largest feeder and we kill it. And the flow in these vascular malformations is extremely high. So before embolizing, we reduce the blood pressure, we give systemic hypo, uh, uh, significant systemic hypotension, reduce the blood pressure to less than about 40 to 60, and then we embolize it. Because otherwise the embolic material that we inject into the blood would just fly into the lungs. So it is an extremely strenuous uh, situation. Our heart rate will be 200 <laughs> during those embolizations. So this is once a child presenting with uh, coronal type uh, vein of gallon malformations. After four sessions of embolization, you can see a complete cure. Then I want to touch base on acute stroke. This is a hot topic. Practically, um, in 2015, we had plethora of uh, evidence uh, about endovascular uh, thrombectomy being extremely effective for acute strokes. But the concept of uh, management of acute stroke or the treatment of acute stroke has not caught up in our society. I think each one of you in this room plays a significant role in spreading this knowledge and uh, helping these patients who present with an acute stroke. Let me just go through briefly about the management of acute stroke. There are basically two types of stroke. One is an ischemic stroke due to occlusion, other is a hemorrhagic stroke. The most common is ischemic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke is literally less common what are the treatment options? IV thrombolytics, they were approved in 1995. Since then, we have been using it extensively in India. It has been extensively used. IV thrombolytics, uh, we have various drugs, um, and it has to be given within the first four and a half hours. Intraarterial thrombolytics were tried, but they have not really got it to work. They are not, there is no study to really prove that intraarterial thrombolytics are very effective. Then intraarterial thrombolytics with the uh, various uh, ultrasound, uh, ultrasound intraarterial ultrasound devices were tried. They didn't uh, become really uh, popular. Then came the mechanical thrombectomy, or the endovascular thrombectomy. This we started doing in 2008. Since then, it has only seen an upward trend. And today we are able to uh, treat a lot of patients within the first six to eight hours of the onset of stroke. Six to eight hours of the onset of stroke with mechanical thrombectomy. So within the uh, eight, uh, eight to nine years, we have made a giant leap in the management of acute strokes. I just want to introduce to you the device that we use for acute stroke. These are the stent retrievers. The first one that came into market is the Solitaire device, then the Trevo and Revive uh, device. These are the devices that we use. I just want to play a short video just to uh, show you how we treat these acute strokes. This is the internal carotid artery. This is the internal carotid, this is the middle cerebral artery. A clot is sitting in there, we bring a micro wire, then the micro catheter. We are deploying the stent retriever. And we leave it for five minutes. These stent retrievers are made of nitinol. They just expand with the body temperature. They just grab the clot. about five to six minutes for it to grab the clot. Then we arrest the flow in the vessel. And we just pull the clot out. 
I wish it worked like this every time, but it doesn't. <laughs> but usually with the first attempt, we will be successful in about 60% of the cases. With about two or three attempts we are in, in today, when I talk to a patient, I can tell him that 90 to 95% of the time, I'll be able to recanalize the vessel completely. And the clinical improvement does not really reflect uh, recanalization. Clinical improvement you can expect in recanalized patients, about 60 to 65% of the patients will have good, significant clinical improvement. <coughs> Let me just go back. One such patient, a 70 year old male with uh, hypertension, dyslipidemia, MA, about 8 years ago, found out at about 8 30 a.m. in an extra scale of 25. Uh, you can see a hypertensive CA sign here. This is where the clot is sitting. This is the initial angiogram showing occlusion of the middle cerebral artery here. Complete occlusion. This part of the brain is not being perfused. Here you can, oops, here you can see the stent retriever in place. And this is after recanalization. You can see the whole <coughs> hemisphere is being perfused. Today there are newer devices, uh, direct aspiration devices with, with which we can do the whole procedure much faster. Uh, using this device, my fastest time is this is a direct aspiration device where we put it right into the clot and we just suck it out. My fastest time is about 11 minutes for an acute stroke and uh, it, average time today is about say 30 to 40 minutes for most cases and uh, there are some cases which go on for about 1 to 2 hours. So these are the evidence uh, that, is, that was published in 2015. I'm just going to show you a few other cases. Here is an M M1 occlusion again with complete recanalization. This is the clot that was removed. These are the various uh, clots that I have removed. And uh, today we also extend uh, the recanalization not just to ICA, ACA, MCA, but even distal. M2 segments, we are also able to do these mechanical thrombectomy, especially with the left hemisphere. Though the vessel is small and more distal, the patient will have significant speech defect, patient will have comprehension defect, patient will have word finding difficulty. So these patients do benefit. We just chase the clot up to M2 at least today. So the, here is the clot. I put the stent retriever here, the stent retriever in place, and the clot is removed. This is the stent retriever with the clot, the complete mechanization. <coughs> so when you find Please educate your uh, patients. When you find somebody with an acute stroke, please tell them what are the signs. You don't need an EKG to find somebody having an acute stroke. I mean, for, for a myocardial infarction, you need other devices. It's so simple. Uh, they can find uh, people, they can ask for, uh, uh, ask for a smile, ask for a stretch, and ask them to speak. If they can smile normally, if they can stretch, and if they can understand and speak, then stroke is unlikely. <laughs> so, uh, the take home message here for an acute stroke is within the first four and a half hours, you can give them IV TPA, and uh, with medical management, there is a hope that the vessel will recanalize. Uh, for, uh, for up to six to eight hours, we can do mechanical thrombectomy. Even beyond eight hours, there are some subset of patients who have ischemic penumbral zone whom we can help. We do CT perfusion. So, when, when, when somebody is uh, having an acute stroke, even if it is beyond 8 hours, do consult a neurologist who is uh, up to date with the uh, management of acute stroke and they can certainly make a difference. Okay, the advantages, I just want to finish off, advantages of pinhole neurosurgery being is that we can treat difficult diseases which were deemed untreatable in the past and we treat it with a minimally invasive fashion, less painful, less morbid and shorter hospital stay and no cosmetic deformity. And in the past, it was considered to be an alternate therapy, but today it has become the primary modality of care. I thank you, everyone. Any questions? Yes, sir. Question. Uh, I believe uh, there are also some downside to the thrombectomy, like the clot can get dislodged mm -hmm. and also hyperperfusion injury. Yes. Uh, hyperperfusion injury is certainly a factor, but today the symptomatic ICH rate in an acute stroke is about 6% and not young. Compared to uh, the benefit that we have, the 6% symptomatic ICH, which is due to reperfusion injury, is extremely low. What about clot dislodging and causing 
Yes, in most cases today we are able to uh, retrieve the clot and reperfuse the big vessel and the risk of having a distal clot I would say is less than 10%. So I don't see it as a major impediment and even if the clot dislodges, it would go and lodge in a small uh, non eloquent territory and the patient would be completely asymptomatic from it. It will work like a small stroke. Do you need to give antiplatelets before doing these procedures? No, we don't. Post procedure, a lot of people do antiplatelets, but uh, I usually wait for, for 24 hours before I put them on any antiplatelets. Because the patient would have received IV, TP or, uh, already, so we would wait for about 24 hours to put the platelets on. There is an overlap of both the speakers, but I would like to share a personal experience just now I got a, before I came to the meeting. I got a phone call from UK, one of my brother's son was hospitalized for cerebral hemorrhage about two months back. And he was found to have this middle cerebral aneurysm. And what the, both the speakers have shown, that endovascular coiling was done, and remarkable improvement, and that individual himself spoke to me, saying that I'm doing fine. Because many of them see these pictures in WhatsApp, and we think this is all more like a fiction, or a, a scientific, uh, what can you say, it's a cinema. But in reality, this is picking up a lot. And I had a patient who was 15 year old, he threw a fit in the uh, school when he was removing this bicycle and he was found out to be having arteriovenous malformation and they did a radio surgical procedure in Apollo Hospital and that boy is doing very well. Now thanks to the science and technology advancement, only these meetings only as he rightly said, the primary care physician should be sensitized about the developments that is happening. But probably we may not be able to afford this treatment to all of, it, of our clients. But at least we can give them an option that there is enough possibility that these procedures can be done. I believe that coiling is a very whopping amount because... Not really. I think it is a... Uh, uh, I think um, it is in fact compared to open surgery it is a bit costlier. But I don't see it to be extremely costly. See for example... Uh, uh, 3 or 4 millimeter aneurysm, the total cost of the procedure would be as good as the surgery. It would be about 3 to 4 lakhs. Open surgery do cost that much. In Apollo and other major hospitals, it does cost the same. Uh, if it's a large aneurysm, for example, the newer invention, the flow diverter that I showed you, would cost about 10 lakhs. Yes, it is costly. But all these technology are uh, developed following a significant amount of research that is happening in the US and all this are not being indigenously made in India. We import every little wire, catheter and the coils from the US and obviously we are paying the price for that. Hopefully like the cardiac stents in future in about 5-10 years down the lane, we'll have indigenous products and uh, the whole treatment will become cheaper and more and more affordable. And today, I, I mean, uh, you wouldn't believe uh, these procedures are, some of these procedures are being done in government hospitals. So even, I mean, of part of it patient may be buying, but like for the most part, uh, the government is sponsoring it and uh, it's being done. It's being part of the CM scheme also covers these procedures as well. Does that be covered in the insurance? Uh, yes, it yes, does. Yes, yes. yes. Absolutely. All the private insurance do cover it.